Hello and welcome to my session at .NET 2020. I am so grateful to be here. My name is Noelle Silver and I'm going to walk you through my journey as I got started in AI and machine learning and the things I did to gain expertise as quickly as possible. But before I get started, I probably should tell you a tiny bit about me so you know where I'm coming from. So the first thing is, well, I have a family. I have four children. I have uh, one of them has Down syndrome. Actually, that's him on the screen, Max, holding the heart. And one of the reasons I got into artificial intelligence was because when he was born 15 years ago, there wasn't a whole lot of hope for him. Um, a lot of people you know, basically told me that the world would be limited in access to him. And as voice became a very popular mechanism for interacting with technology, really the world, those limitations lifted. Um, another interesting turn of events, when I first started getting into technology, I started looking around my life to find different ways that I could help to just my own personal experience um, and those around me have a better uh, way of interacting with technology. And so my dad, um, at the time, this was about, uh, gosh, I guess it was like seven years ago, um, maybe eight years, seven or six or seven, anyway, somewhere in there. But he was walking across the street in Seattle as a pedestrian. He ran and walked every single day. He was a Marine or is a Marine. Anyway, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, and he was hit by a car and it changed his life. Like he had a traumatic brain injury. He was really, um, he was in the intensive care unit for six months, staring up at the ceiling um, with a C collar on. Some of you know this really difficult healing process that happens. And Alexa had just been born and I was on, or I wanted to be on this team because I saw opportunity. I saw the ability for me to make things that were accessible on his phone and on a computer, which until this accident, he had no problem using. But now all of a sudden, it was hard for him. And so I really got convicted and, and very interested in how do I learn this technology enough to make a difference in the lives of my children, in the lives of my parents. Um, and as technologists right now, we have more power than we've ever had to be able to change things with this technology. And so I'm gonna show you how to get started, but it really is only the beginning. Um, very quickly, I am currently the head of the data science and analytics program as well as the full stack program at HackerU, and we provide university education globally. Um, I also am the founder of the AI Leadership Institute, where we deliver training, education, classes, um, and consulting for companies all around how to use artificial intelligence, how to be more data-driven, and most importantly, the ethical and responsible use of AI. And I also am the managing editor of my organization's uh, periodical, the AI Leadership Journal. So, so much <laughs> um, that I am doing, but a lot of it stems around this really amazing journey I started just a few years ago. If you want to learn more about me, I want to focus on the things you can do over the next few minutes. I want to focus on the steps you can take to do just what I did and become really an expert if you want to be in artificial intelligence and in machine learning. And uh, you can check out noelle.ai anytime if you wanna learn more about me and what I do uh, in the world. Now, the last year or so has been pretty interesting. I've gotten a bunch of different awards and I won't spend a lot of time here, but it's just to tell you that, you know, it was not an overnight success. This was years and years in the making. So as you begin your journey, know that this is, possible. Like I came in as I was an AWS training manager and I wanted to go and work on Alexa. I had Alexa, right? The, the biggest natural, uh, you know, language processing uh, platform on the planet at the time for sure. <laughs> and it was incredible to me because I had no skills in this area. I had a passion, a desire, and most importantly, aptitude to be able to pick up that technology. And so I, I went and I applied for the role. And so that's kind of tip number one, is that in order for you to get to the end, <laughs> right, get to your goal, 
you have to take a step into the unknown because you won't know the job before you get it, right? You'll know maybe what you can learn through what I'm talking about now, but really this world needs people with different perspective and different ideas to come in and be willing to learn and be willing to acquire the knowledge on the job. So it's much less about you know, the PhDs that you have, though that's still important for certain roles, and much more about the passion and aptitude you have. And as you can see by the look on my face, <laughs> I am always pretty excited. And of course, most recently, I was awarded uh, Microsoft's Most Valuable Professional in AI. What an incredible honor. I always want to take an opportunity to thank Microsoft for that recognition, but also to let you know that, again, seven years ago, I knew nothing. I was teaching, you know, instructors and managing instructors in Amazon Web Services. Like, I was not geared or born and bred or classically trained in the art of artificial intelligence. So it is, it is accessible, it is achievable, and it is available to you. So I just encourage you to, over the next, you know, 30, 40 minutes, take a journey with me because I do think if you have a passion for it and you're willing to work hard, you can actually achieve a pretty decent level of expertise with the steps I'm about to show you. Now, I always like to talk, start my talks um, with a quote, and this quote has actually been repeated to me by many CEOs that I have worked for, and I've worked for some of the best and brightest, right? I've worked at IBM, Red Hat, VMware, right? All these great companies that have gone through immense transition periods in our technical history, um, of course, at Amazon and Microsoft. So as I share this with you, um, I'll, I'll just let you know, like Jeff Bezos actually had it on his fridge. And that's when I uncovered it. He sent a message on Twitter and was like, I have my kids read this all the time. And I was like, what a great quote. So I'll share it with you. What is success? To laugh often and much to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate the beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. Now, I originally saw this uh, and it was quoted as Ralph Waldo Emerson, a metaphysician, poet laureate, right? Like just very popular um, poet had written it. And then upon, you know, I started just advocating for this poem because I loved it so much. And someone was like, you should do some research. He didn't actually write it. And I found out that actually a woman wrote it. And it was really uh, a testament to some of the lessons I've learned in artificial intelligence and in data, that on the surface, things are not always what they seem, and that doing your research and making sure that the story you're telling is authentic, is real, and is honest. Um, and so I now give credit to them both. <laughs> but it is a big part of my journey, and I'll talk to you a little bit about why that is. So as I mentioned, you now have more power than ever, right? You've got tools, technologies, APIs, resources that have made it easier for you to implement artificial intelligence and machine learning within your projects. It's easier than ever. You've got more resources than many, all the generations combined up till this point. However, with this great, immense, incredible power, I always you know, mention this quote, maybe you can help me finish it, right? With great power comes, right? Great responsibility. <laughs> so for right, Uncle Ben, Spider-Man, like, yes, I'm a superhero person, but it is so true in this space. When you have the power to leverage technology in this way that I'm about to show you, I want to encourage you to overemphasize the ability for you to use this power for good. There are so many incredible uh, use cases that need your perspective and your voice and your help. Um, and we also need, you know, we're, we're kind of in that stage of ethical hacking, right? We need people that are ethical AI 
implementers, people who will make better choices about the use of this technology and will ask better questions when they're building it. So we can use this technology that I'm about to show you to change everything about the world. We can change healthcare, finance, retail, right? You name it. It's inc incredible, the opportunity that is at our fingertips. But one of the things I think that's really important, and this is for not just you who are looking to get into AI as a career path, but also all the hiring managers out there, we really need to change the way our, our engineering teams are made. We need to value the perspectives of those who are not natively and classically trained in this technology. I'll tell you some of my favorite, best data scientists I've ever worked with were not classically trained in data or statistics or probability, right? They were sociology majors or they were from, you know, they were psychologists or they understood humans. And one thing that I'm very passionate about is improving the ingenuity of human beings. So what better way to do that than to attract people into this space than no human behavior so that we can accurately improve it, help it, augment it in a way that is useful and helpful. But we do have to change it. So if you look around now, we, I, I won't judge it. I won't call it a problem. Okay, maybe I will. But we definitely have a homogeneous environment in my world. So in technology, as I've moved from company to company and team to team, I've noticed that a lot of people look the same. They're act, they say the same things. They talk the same. They're from the same backgrounds. They go to the same schools. And though that creates a really nice culture um, where no one argues with each other because they all agree and think the same and no one presents new ideas because they all kind of share that same ideology, what happens is, is that we end up building products that only serve that group. And when they go to market, especially now in the age of AI, we find that those teams unfortunately didn't think empathetically about their users and their users are much more diverse than the homogeneous group of people that have built this software. So as I mentioned, if you're here and you wanna learn more about AI and machine learning and you wanna get into this field, there couldn't be a better time because we need you more than ever. So of course I want to help you get started and I will tell you, the basic way that I've gotten started is pretty simple. I wanted to make a difference. Um, and one of the things that became very important to me was like asking the right question about the technology. What I started to notice early in my exposure to, to AI and, and machine learning is that a lot of machine learning engineers were going and going, oh, I see a problem, I'm gonna solve that. And they solved it from the very unique perspective of their world, which is not terrible, but it's not holistic. And it doesn't include the incredibly important perspective of the domain expert. So I'll give you a couple of examples. One, I had the wonderful opportunity to go and be a um, mentor and MC for the first ever AI hackathon at Abbey Road right, in Studio One, the, like, place where all great music was made. <laughs> um, okay, battle me out in the comments. Um, but Abbey Road, like, we were doing an AI hackathon at Abbey Road. It was incredible. But the reason it was so incredible was it wasn't machine learning people trying to figure out music. It was music asking questions. It was music, the music industry, producers and DJs, the people in the industry saying, here's my problem, how can we solve it with this technology? I think that's key. And I feel like that's part of our you know, responsibility as AI engineers, is that we don't just solve problems from our unique perspective. We do the work of finding those who have the problem authentically in their world and bring them in to contribute to how we build the solution. So always and continue to think about the ethic, ethical and responsible path towards using whatever technology you plan to use. I will iterate this over and over again. The reason I do is because we just didn't ask these questions early enough, I don't think, within the mainstream use of AI that we see today. And we're starting to see the repercussions of this, right? We're starting to see companies like 
Amazon and Facebook pull out of facial recognition because the data is bad, right? Because it's now we realize that, oops, we only trained it on a majority of data that's homogeneous, just like the people that created it. It's not a problem that we can't solve, but we're now, because of the cost of not asking those questions early, it's prohibitively expensive for companies to be able to step back and solve them. So what can we do differently? We can ask better questions and we can encourage people who are just getting started on their journey to think ethics first. AI and ethics should be the first thing to come to your mind when you start building your solution. And I hope I can encourage you to do that. Now, the way I learned, um, the way I acquired my knowledge is really to learn by doing. So the rest of this session is the step-by-step -step components I'm going to give you that I did to learn how to build different programmatic solutions. Now, I'm actually going to cover two different platforms here because it just depends on your skill set. If you're technical and you're coming and you learn Java like I did in the 90s and you're just trying to learn something new, then you'll be able to jump right into some of these APIs. But if you need a maybe slower ramp, <laughs> I'm going to also show you some opportunities where you can go and build in a no-code way um, that would be maybe pretty beneficial. So let's get started. So here is a collection. I, of course, I'm using a collection from Microsoft, but this is agnostic. These models are available across all the great vendors um, out there like IBM Watson and Google Cloud Platform and Amazon Web Services, but not all of them in the same way. One thing I do like about Microsoft's cognitive services and their applied AI models is that they were built to be shared. They were built not as a productized, you know, individualized um, service, but they were actually built in research and development. And then only after they achieved a certain level of success as a research project, did they get promoted, if you will, to becoming um, a project that you see here. So there's so many, so many of these that I can show you. I'm just going to focus on a couple. So before, ooh, sorry, I went too fast. All right. So here we go. The first thing I want to do is actually show you how you can go into the browser and you can test out some of these models. So here you'll see I am on the just plain old sales page for cognitive. Uh, this is cognitive search. I actually want to look for cognitive services. So let's see. Uh, I'm just going to go to Microsoft cognitive services. There we go. Right, so comes right up in Google, pretty easy. Now here you'll see Azure Cognitive Services, it's just the sales page. I'm gonna scroll down, but it's not like any other sales page I've ever seen. <laughs> what it allows you to do is actually test out the models right within the browser. So I'm gonna show you this because this is a no-code way to get started, a no-code way to start understanding how these models work and how you might end up trying to use them. So there are a few things here uh, that I want to point out. I'm not going to demo these, but I do want to show them to you. Anomaly detection is a huge opportunity, right? Imagine, if you will, <laughs> this is true story, that there are engineers on the planet that half their day is spent analyzing, visually analyzing things, like with their eyes, looking at hardware, pictures of hardware and trying to determine whether that hardware is good or bad and flagging them accordingly. They do this work manually and computers are actually really good at this, really good at identifying differences and pulling out like, oh, all of these are good. This one's different than all of these good pictures. Let me pull it out and not make a judgment about it. Simply identify it as different and let the human do that discernment. It's a really great service. Content moderation, now more than ever. Wouldn't it be great to put a police person, right, a filter at the front of your education platform or at the front um, of your school and, and be able to prevent content that you don't want, um, you know, in your environment from ever showing up in front of a child? That's pretty amazing. So this is another one, and it's just an API. So all of these are APIs. And when I say that, for those of you who are brand new, APIs are application programming interfaces. And these interfaces are basically ways where you can make a single call, maybe a couple calls, 
to a um, to a uh, programming interface, and then those calls will actually do a bunch of work for you. And in this case, invoke the magic that is the machine learning model behind the scenes. So let me show you a couple examples so we can take a look. I always like looking at computer vision because it's super fun, but I'll also show you speech. So I encourage you to walk through all of these because as I mentioned, when you go in, you could scroll down and you'll actually be able to test these models out right within the browser. So you'll see here, there's already these bounding boxes um, and these rectangles are shown with their axes, axes <laughs> um, in uh, the metadata that's provided. So this is the preloaded image and you can already start to understand the data that you get back. So you're gonna send an image into the API as a parameter and then it's gonna send you back metadata and that metadata you can use to make decisions in your code. So you can see here, for example, it says in this bound, bo bound box, you have maybe a person. And look, this is my favorite part. This is machine learning, the confidence in that prediction, right? I think it's a person, I'm 76% confident. And I'll just go to the next one here. In the next box, there's another person. I'm less confident that this is a person. That makes sense, right? Because you can probably see it's a little bit even more blurry. Then I go to the next one, a subway train. All right, um, let's see, which seems to be, yeah, subway train, a vehicle. Ooh, I'm 92% confident in this. So these, the model is predicting based on all the images it's been trained on, millions of images, it knows what a train kind of looks like because it's got a bunch of images of trains to compare it to. And so it's just making a prediction based on what it knows on is this like what I already know? And if it is, it gives you a higher number. If it isn't, it gives you a lower number. What your job to do is if you are using this data, you're gonna pass in an image, it's gonna send you back a number, 76, 92. When you get that number, you need to decide what is your threshold for using that prediction, right? So for example, if you're in healthcare, I think you want a very high level of precision, right? You wanna make sure you have a high level of, of confidence that the model is making the right decision before you go and tell someone, you know, you're on track for diabetes or you're, you know, you're overweight. Like you wanna be 90, 90, let's say X percent sure that you're making the right prediction where in things like this, where maybe you're going to, I don't know, provide automated metadata for a website for SEO purposes, maybe you could be 76% sure, <laughs> right? So you, at, depending on your application, whether you're in healthcare or digital marketing, will need to make a decision about how do these percentages relate to you. So let's take a look at another one. There's so many cool ones down here, but I did wanna show you a person Right, so here you can see these boxes. If I hover over it, it'll show you how the model has predicted it. This is all metadata that you get back from the model. Like, oh, I think this is seating, and I think this is a computer, and I think this is a person. Let's take a look at another image, like this one. Right, now, I know canned images aren't super exciting, so I always like to head on out to a browser, <laughs> and let's just look for our own inspiration quotes, right? And I will just grab one of these. That looks nice. So I'll copy the link address from here. I think that'll work. Let's see. And you'll see here, it asked me to choose a model. There's OCR and image analysis, and I'm gonna actually ask it to do OCR. So you can see it actually pulls the text right off the image, but I wanna pass it my own. Oh, it doesn't end in a JPEG, so that's not gonna work. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually save this to my, ma my machine, quote, and I will go back and load it. There it is. And you can see it here. And so it pulls all the text right off of that, which is really useful. I actually think about it from an accessibility perspective because some people might not, A, they might not be able to see this, but if they're using some kind of narrator, I now can automatically take this text 
as opposed to me having to type it in, I can automatically make this my alt text, right? Or I can automatically make it available to someone through a narration service, increasing the accessibility of my platform, of my content. And that's just one use case, right? But it does give me that ability. Let's see if I change it to analyze image and browse if it has the ability to pick up anything else in that image. All right. It's no, I don't think it sees much, right? 55% confidence, basically tossing a coin. <laughs> so, right, I think it's great though. These are what you have to do. Like just play around with it, see what kind of data you get back. Um, but the ability for you to go in and just simply grab anything and use, you know, and upload it into this model so that you can see how it would perform without downloading an IDE or loading up and having to, you know, build your own curl requests. Like, this is incredible. It's an incredible way to start learning. Okay, so that's one. Computer vision. I think it's kind of fun. Um, I'm going to also go down. I think there are some other ones. Handwriting recognition, which is pretty cool. Um, oops. And being able to, you know, look at the different options that are available. I don't think I'm being patient enough. Um, oh, and also being able to see the JSON that passes in that information. I think that's pretty important as well. Uh, okay, so let's go back. I'm just gonna head back over to a different service, Speech. This is another one. As a developer, I always was like, man, I wish I could do better or more translation, but it was always hard. It was difficult to do. <laughs> and the main reason it was difficult is because I couldn't do it. I had to send it off somewhere. Those resources were limited, therefore much more expensive, and they were limited, so it took a lot of time. But now I have the ability to do real-time translation through an API. Imagine this. Another really cool capability here is the ability to just do language detection. So what happens if you open up your website to the world and you let your users speak in their native language? I was born, or not born, I was raised in Miami, Florida. I was born in New York for those who want to know. <laughs> but I was raised in Miami and in Miami, a lot of people speak Spanish and they prefer to speak Spanish, um, you know? And, and so how do we... How do we make sure that we, as a company, as a pr producer of products and services, how do we make sure that we start with our customer, that we meet them where they are? And this is one now very simple service that we can use to get there. So I'll go in and show you speech translation, real-time speech translation, though I'm not going to actually translate it first. So I come to the translation page, and you'll see again, it is a sales page, but it also shows us the ability in browser to change what we see. Right now it's set to finish. I'm just gonna set it to English so we can kind of see how it works. So I'm gonna choose speak and what it's gonna do is start the collection of data, which is my voice, and then immediately begin translating. I'm gonna, of course, enable my microphone. Oh my gosh, okay, there we go. Hello everyone, welcome. I hope you can still hear me. Let's see how this translation thing works. Isn't this amazing? I can't believe it. Oh no, I hope it didn't actually disable my microphone. Okay, period. All right, so some things I wanna bring your attention to. Stop. <laughs> so you can see, look, isn't that this amazing? Do you remember when I said that and I added this inflection? Question mark, what? Period. Oh my goodness, that's amazing. I love it. The fact that I can now do dictation and it automatically picks up my punctuation. How many times have I said to Siri, like, send a text and I have to add, like, period, exclamation point, <laughs> heart emoji. Um, so this is really interesting. Let's go ahead and take a look at, I don't know, another language like French or something. So I'm just gonna choose French. I don't speak French, I like French, but I don't speak it. So somebody here will have to check. Hello and welcome. I'm so excited that you are here. Isn't this amazing? Have a great day. Bonjour, that's right, I think, right? I think that's one word, but yeah, not too bad. N'est-ce pas incroyable? Oh, that's so cool. Anyway, you could see, right? All I have to do is enable someone to turn on their microphone and the world opens up to them. 
they now have the ability to operate in their natural habitat, <laughs> right? In the language that they know best, which eliminates some of the confusion. And, you know, we have a term for this, lost in translation. We don't have to be. We can actually embrace our customers and users right where they are using the language that's native to them. So again, this is just one example, pretty interesting, um, I think, but so many. So step number one, homework number one, head on over to Cognitive Services and just start playing with these models right within the browser to understand the metadata you get back and the way that you can use these models in your own applications. So my role in artificial intelligence really evolved when I left being a AWS training manager and became an Alexa solutions architect. And I dove right in, right? I wanted to learn as much as I could about conversational AI. And one opportunity you have is to really go and build Alexa skills. You don't even really need any experience or any coding experience to do it. Today we have blueprints, a lot of them based on my own skills that I built, but you could do this today. Um, but one thing that always worried me was when we siloed all of our work, all of our efforts into a single place. And so one thing that I worked on, um, and one reason I went to go work uh, at an organization known as NPR, National Public Radio, they are, NPR is like the best at audio experiences. Their Alexa skills are phenomenal. And I was super interested in helping them take that to the next level. And one thing I under, you know, I found out when I got there was, and this is true for many companies, because we've got kind of Alexa skills and Google Home and Bixby and you name it, right? Facebook Messenger, people are having to build chatbots and skills all in separate teams. Like there's different people that own these different experiences. And I became really interested in that. I'm like, wait a second, I don't want to have a whole team duplicating the effort on Alexa for Google Home and Bixby. Like that doesn't make sense that I'm duplicating this work. I wanna build it one time, one infrastructure to rule them all and then distribute that experience across different channels. And so I uncovered at my time at Microsoft and now as a Microsoft AI MVP, I uncovered this ability to do just that, right? The ability to create your intelligence foundation and framework through the use of different models, accessing different business processes across any vendor, right? It could be Salesforce, it could be AWS, it could be Azure, it could be databases, it could be on-premises uh, resources that you have. And you could now build a single foundational layer of business logic that could be then uh, delivered across a bunch of different channels. So let me give you an example, just so you can kind of pull this together and understand what I mean. So let's say I'm at home and I'm, you know, leaving for the day and I say, oh, you know, Alexa, hey, tell me my calendar, show, tell me what's on my schedule today. And then I ask Alexa to move things around for me. Now, if I'm connected to a shared service, right, then hopefully any other channel I go to will hit that shared service and realize that I made those changes. However, many times these things are siloed and they are not communicating to each other. Like, what would it be like if I could start a conversation in my house on Alexa, go to my car where I'm on CarPlay or Siri, continue the same conversation, and then get to my office, talk to my laptop uh, that's running Windows 10, and continue the same conversation. Maybe, you know, for some of us being on hold for, you know, at a bank or booking travel, <laughs> all good old days of booking travel. Mm. Um, but when we're, we're doing those types of activities, right, we might not be able to do it in one sitting. It might take multiple attempts. So wouldn't it be great if I didn't, as the user, have to care what platform I was on to continue that conversation? Maybe if I'm on Facebook, I could use Facebook Messenger and it would be like, oh, when you were in your car on, you know, whatever, CarPlay, you, you said this. Would you like to pick up where you left off, right? And the only way that that's possible is with this standardized, um, persistent store of your conversation. 
And so this is a shift because up until now, we basically have been building experiences for each platform, one for Alexa, one for Google, one for Messenger. And now what I'm asking you to do as you move into this journey is to think a little bit differently about it, to instead come from the perspective of like, what if, <laughs> what if I could build this once and just you know, create an interface to it through Google, through Slack, through you know, Teams. This is available. The technology is available today. Now, I want to show you a really cool, um, another like learn by doing um, option that you have. Oops, not quite yet. Uh, let me escape. And I'll show you this learn by doing through the bot framework. You could just Google Microsoft bot frameworks on GitHub and this will pop right up. But what I like about it is that it'll show you a bunch of different options. But remember, we're talking about building a core platform with a bunch of different skills. And those skills might be how to deploy it on Alexa, how to deploy it on Google, you know, uh, Google Home, on Slack, on Teams. We build new ones all the time. Here's the coolest part. You can actually build an adapter if you have a place you need this to go and it's not available yet you can help, you can actually be a foundational creator in this space because it's relatively, still relatively early. So I encourage you to go out here and take a look. This is the second way. Again, I just showed you a couple other types of models, computer vision, language translation. This is more along the conversational AI route, but very similar. And what I did when I got started building solutions for Alexa is I literally downloaded GitHub repos cloned them and started rebuilding them. So I didn't fork them. I literally cloned them to my local machine and built an exact replica. I did this seven to 10 times just so that I could create some muscle memory around how do I build out these projects. So speaking of projects, I want to show you one um, as well. This one is called the Intelligent Kiosk. And I'll tell you, this is one of my favorite projects. It's also got a lot of new love from Microsoft. It's updated all the time. And you can, of course, contribute to those updates as you start playing around with it. But the, the um, intelligent kiosk really is an application. It's like a test harness for all of these different APIs. It's kind of similar to the website. It gives you the ability to build an application inside Visual Studio and allows you to build in the API calls for all these different services. So the benefit of doing it is that you get to learn without having to build separate applications with separate use cases that you have to think of or find or solve for, you can build all of this. And this is the muscle memory I'm talking about, right? Building the kiosk sample, adding in all the services, getting that code to work. Don't just download it and run it. Like you rebuild it from scratch with your type in every letter. Because one of the gifts, of course, if you are a developer, you know this, one of the things we do and the way we learn is fingers on the keyboard, <laughs> muscle memory, developing routines. And, you know, like some of these hotkeys that I use, some of the, you know, um, different code assist mechanisms I use within um, code, I don't even know that I'm doing them because I've done them so often. And in order to get there, you have to start by just putting your fingers on a keyboard and building out some samples. So the Intelligent Kiosk sample is one of my favorites. I'd encourage you to use it. And I'll show you how to get a list of these resources at the end of my talk, which is almost here. Um, so let me keep going. <laughs> um, so the, oops, I do want to um, go back and share with you some of the things that I think will be useful to you as a new, oh, I don't want to share it. I said share. <laughs> um, one of the things I think will be useful to you as you move into the world of AI. AI is such a cool place because we as a world care more about data than we've ever cared before. And as a result, the world has curated data sets for your use. This is how we train a model. Right? The only way that machine learning models are able to create predictions is because they've been trained on some data to tell them good versus bad, right? Decision, one decision versus another. And so here I provide you a list of open data sets. And as I mentioned at the end, I'll show you how you can get this deck as well as all of the links and resources I've shown so far. 
Um, but it's really important to know, of course, we're in a global pandemic right now. So wouldn't it be great to start, like, remember AI for good and thinking about ways we can make a difference? Maybe you could look at this data and see something different because of your background or because of your perspective. This is where your unique experience in life can help you solve a problem in a way that no one is thinking about because no one is you. There's also uh, the Global Health Organization has their own set of data sources and data sets. Um, Google has its own explorer list. This is a repository, a collection of data sets. Same with Rhoda on AWS, a collection, a registry of data sets for you to use. And one of my favorites, um, I mentioned to you earlier, the uh, first example of getting domain experts involved in solving problems with AI. And I talked about Abbey Road. The second example was actually, I got an opportunity to work with the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the incredible data scientist organization at MIT. And we came together in order to solve problems for the art world. And we couldn't do it alone. Just because I love art doesn't make me the right person to solve that problem or speak to the problems that exist. So we got in a room with curators and curators and AI sat together, uh, those da and data scientists sat together and came up with some pretty incredible solutions. So this is the data set that sparked that conversation for that hackathon, but it also created a lab that you can rebuild. So I will share that with you now. There is a really great website called AI Labs. This is where different engineers, you could do this as well, Different engineers go and they provide projects that they've worked on, but the best part is they give you a GitHub repo so you can build the project yourself. So here you'll see if I scroll down all these really fun projects, um, Snow Leopard Trust, I'm sure you've heard about that, but if not, um, you'll have to, I will tell you about it. I talk about it all the time on my social channels, but the one I want to show you really is uh, inside all projects. And it was based on this Metropolitan Museum of Art pro, uh, hackathon that we did. And you can kind of see there's so many cool, fun projects to build. But you can see it here. Learn about Gen Studio, and it's an AI for good project, but it allows you to go in and really interact with the project and participate in the project. So definitely take a look at that when you get uh, a moment. There are just so many incredible things that you can do with open data sets today. And this is just a tiny, tiny little uh, collection. There are so many available. And just remember what I started talking about earlier. One of, just think about the questions you wanna ask yourself before you even use these data sets. Do these data sets represent all the demographics that need to be represented? was the collection diverse in nature? Because this could be the thing you provide alone. It's just going into a data set that maybe is missing a perspective and helping it become more rich and authentic in nature. Um, because this is a challenge we have today. Our data sets are being trained and the data is being collected by a homogeneous group of people. And so we can't or don't necessarily look to make sure that those data sets are holistic. And so this is something that you can even provide um, as a service if it's something that's interesting to you. Now, the last thing I want to talk to you about is advocacy, because it's so important. Right now, you are about to start this journey. If you are listening to me uh, talk about all these great, cool tips and tricks that you can use, one of the things I want to encourage you to think about is documenting your journey. Start documenting it right now. Like right now, you maybe you know a little bit. Maybe you know maybe you know nothing, <laughs> but start documenting it. Whether you are a person who likes to blog your pen to paper, whether you are a person who likes video like me, <laughs> or whether you're a person who just likes to speak, you can use a podcast, whatever it is. Because I will tell you, there are so many people, as soon as you start this journey, there are gonna be people right behind you wondering what to do, wondering what link to click and what resources to look up. And as you navigate and document your journey through navigating the learning of AI, people can follow in your footsteps. And here's the most important thing, you represent a unique perspective. And there's someone, I always think about it, there's some six-year-old out there, some 12-year-old, some 15-year-old who's going, gosh, I just don't see me represented. I don't see how I could do this work. And so the more 
all of us, and I mean all of us, take time to document our journey in this space, the more people will be inspired to join us. So I hope you will do it. If you have any, you know, let's say, uh, you're not as experienced or you don't have all the skills, tools, techniques, you don't know how to write a blog or create one, you don't know about YouTube or podcasting, I can help you. But you can head out to lovefluencers.com and it's free. It's like just an opportunity to join a community and we do free training every week all about how to get your voice, your message and your journey out into the world. But I highly encourage it because it is so inspiring when we see a whole new group of thought leaders emerging and it won't happen unless you take that step and start documenting your journey. So last but not least, let's connect. I want to give you an opportunity to connect with me. Um, I am available, of course, at Lovefluencers. Um, and noel.ai is my website where you can find out all about the work I'm doing at AI Leadership Institute and sign up for the AI Leadership Journal. Um, and you can find me, of course, on LinkedIn. If you would like to get the resources from this talk, and if you would like to get access to the slide deck, all you have to do is connect with me on LinkedIn and say, hey, remember me? <laughs> I was in the audience. I listened to you at .NET 2020. Um, and once you are on LinkedIn, I will then, in a message, just copy and paste my resources to you. Uh, and I hope you will find them really helpful. And there's lots of other stuff in there that I didn't talk about, like a really cool health bot that was created as an example um, how to create a chat bot in five minutes or less, like so many really cool things that I've worked on over the last year that I want to share with you. So connect with me on LinkedIn, send me a quick message letting me know that you saw me here on .NET 2020. It has been my pleasure. I am so grateful to the team at .NET 2020 for letting me be here and talk to you all. It has been incredible. Please take this knowledge and move forward. Keep moving forward. Keep learning. It is there's never been a better time to be in technology, and I'm really grateful to be sharing this journey with you. So take care, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the show.